yesterday was the same place. Uh, I was start dropping from starvation. <laughs> So, um, I, as far as I understand, we haven't had yet anything about uh, screws and uh, screw theory in the school, and so um, I will kind of fill this gap in the sense that it will be mentioned, you know, in the sense that I will know it, uh, or that I will explain it. Uh, and uh, in my view, um, what is usually called screw theory, uh, in other words, uh, understanding what things like screws, twists, and wrenches are, is uh, the natural way to look at kinematics and, and statics. Uh, many people uh, get very uh, negatively excited about that. Uh, but, of course, I'm not saying that, that it's an exclusive uh, set, I mean, that anything, nothing else is useful. But that's the natural way to look at many problems. And uh, one problem in particular, uh, one large set of related problems, uh, are related to applications which evolve uh, things like cables or, uh, or contacts. Uh, which are, you know, unilateral uh, forces. You can pull the cable, but you cannot push. You can push at the contact, but you cannot pull. And uh, there's lots of work on that. Uh, cable robots, in particular, very fast, work very fast in recent years. And uh, the natural uh, way to look at the simplest things in that area is to, to look at uh, uh, basically convex analysis. Uh, and uh, uh, it's not done very much, so I'll try to introduce you to this kind of, you know, some examples and basic things that I know, and uh, that maybe will suggest how to continue further. Um, so, uh, this is, uh, the talk should have about three parts. Uh, first, I'll talk in general about uh, basically screw theoretical basics. Uh, and then uh, I'll talk about what happens when we take uh, several screws unilaterally. And then I'll look at uh, one particular problem uh, where you have uh, not one body but many bodies and on, on them uh, you act with, again, unilateral uh, systems of forces. Now, I want to um, say that uh, <coughs> this will be in no means exhaustive. It, kind of give you, it will give you a flavor of things. I'll try to explain one or two things a little bit better, but most of the stuff, uh, I think uh, slides will be available to you you can uh, explore on your own. I mean, uh, just to give you an idea, uh, I give, uh, organize uh, a summer school on, on school theory every year, and uh, about half of the slides in this presentation, about 30 or so, are slides that I use there. <coughs> almost all the slides that I use there. The difference is that they are use these slides for a whole day, for eight hours. So I do lots of exercise and stuff like that. I, there's no time for that. So don't be terribly alarmed if you don't understand everything. Uh, but, uh, you know. And so it will be with this uh, provision that's start. Well, if you want to do screw theory, the first uh, important, most important fact about 
these things that uh, you're interested in, they're called twists and wrenches mostly, is that they're vectors. And uh, uh, that should not be a complicated thing, but unfortunately there is a bit of a misconception of what a vector is in, in our field. And a vector is uh, space, is a vector is an element of a vector space. And a vector space has to satisfy certain axioms, which are listed here, and which you can find in every book. Uh, the axioms are related to two operations, addition and multiplication. The vector addition, scalar multiplication. No need to go into them because you very know well you know very well how to add vectors. What's important to notice on this slide is that nowhere on it do I say is it does it say that is a vector is something that has magnitude and direction. These two words do not appear on this slide. The vector doesn't have to have magnitude or direction. So uh, that uh, concept, which works fine when you're looking at three-dimensional vectors in Euclidean space, is better forgotten when you look at abstract uh, vector objects. And so it so happens, the vectors that we're interested in. Here are some simple examples of vectors, and the two basic examples which you have encountered undoubtedly uh, in ideas, uh, of course, this n tuples of n tuples of uh, numbers, and geometrically vectors uh, for you are like for every high school student are, are these things. There are some arrows which typically start at the origin, and we have two. That's their sum. That's the geometrical image that you have of uh, adding them. And this has lots of physical interpretations. Like, you know, these could be two forces which add up another force, or something like that. Now, we're going to look at some other vectors and we want to know what does it mean to add them, what does it mean geometrically, and what does it mean physically to add them? What's the meaning of that? Uh, so, let's look at some examples of, uh, of which may or may not be vectors. So, for example, suppose you had a, uh, <coughs> suppose you have a, are there pens that are not orange? That's the only color available. Okay. Uh, <coughs> so, suppose that you have a, a body attached to a spherical joint. The, the forces that pass through uh, this joint are, uh, of course, uh, forces like that, that pass through the center of the joint. This is the only thing that, let's say, the ground can feel if you hold the angle vector and do something to it. Well, yes. Uh, yeah. Can you see this? No. No. Put uh, the light. Is this any better? Is this better? Orange. Nice color. Blue and orange. Psychedelic, seven physics. Theory. Okay, so uh, anyway, so suppose that you consider all such forces, not three, all of them. Do they form a vector space? Well, this question uh, you have to ask yourself: What does it mean to add them, and what does it mean to multiply them uh, with a number? And to multiply with a number, it means that the force increases in intensity accordingly. When you multiply, when you add them, of course, what you have is is uh, uh, this thing here. And that's how you add forces that pass through the same point. Now, uh, so that turns out to be fine. It's a vector space because it's just like this one. Okay, this one we know from early childhood. That it's a vector space. So, uh, Something that you learn, uh, you know. And, and 
suppose now that you have um, uh, a slightly different example. So what I wrote there, like a horizontal labor. So you know, suppose that you have this horizontal, very thin, infinitely long, very rigid beam, and uh, and suppose that you apply forces at any point of it, uh, which are vertical in the same plane, uh, and you can apply lots of those uh, everywhere, and so on. But the question again is, is this a vector space, these forces? And of course, <coughs> here you want this kind of same interpretation of addition, a resultant force. So if you get these two forces that I drew somewhere here, the resultant force, which will be the sum of these two, right? And it will be at a certain distance closer to the bigger one and will be pointing down. And physically, you know, if you put something here, and for this to be an equilibrium, this force will have to go in the opposite direction, and then one, two, and three are in equilibrium. So their sum will be zero uh, in, in our sense. So the physical rule of adding these forces is related to this concept, static concept of resultant equilibrium. And, and it would seem that that is a nice vector space because you would have to find properly addition and multiplication, multiplication being, of course, again, increasing intensity. But is this really possible for any two forces? Uh, is it possible, given any two vertical coplanar forces, to find a third vertical coplanar force which will keep them in equilibrium? Anybody? You have 10 seconds to answer the question. Yes, well, no, it's not true because, of course, <coughs> if one force is like that, and the other force is like that, the resultant force must have intensity zero, but they are certainly not in equilibrium because they will rotate the beam. So, <coughs> you need something called a couple, which I'll denote like that. You need something called a couple, which is not the force. Uh, if you add this thing called a couple to these vertical forces, you will get the vector space. You will be able to add any two. Because as it says uh, down here in red, a uh, vector space has to be closed under addition. That's basically the reason why you need to use things like uh, wrenches and screws rather than just forces and lines. Because lines and forces are not a vector space. Uh, this, of course, generalizes, obviously, if you, if you cannot do it with such simple case, certainly you cannot in general uh, expect that any two skewed forces on a rigid body will have a result. So, so that's basically the idea of this uh, thing. Uh, so, in other words, there is, uh, we're looking for vector spaces which will describe subjects and kinematics. And forces are not such a vector space. And uh, the same exactly thing happens if you look at instantaneous motions. So, uh, so for example, if you look at uh, some sort of a spherical wrist, uh, well, this is difficult to actuate, although you know, we could, but you know, it doesn't matter how it is organized. <coughs> if we're talking instantaneously, uh, you have here some body with a spherical wrist, uh, and you can think of rotations uh, of a rigid body passing uh, through one point. So you have a uh, you have a body, and you can imagine various hinges passing through this point, which could move it, and then you can. Uh, uh, ask yourself, can I think of these things as vectors? And if I do, what would be the addition and what would be uh, 
multiplication. Any multiplication is easy, you just spin faster on the hinge. What would be addition? And addition, <coughs> what turns out to be a good physical interpretation of addition is that if you have <coughs> you have these two rotations, let's say this one here and this one here. So what it means to I go to row one and row two, two rotations. Well, what is row one plus row two? Well, it is the motion, what is, we define it, you can think of that as a definition. That's the definition of uh, the motion of the, uh, by definition, is the motion of the end effector, which has these two hinges uh, connecting it to ground. So you have an instantaneous, you have a serial chain, it has two joints. These two joints have these rotations. The end effector will have the sum of these rotations. In other words, the resultant rotation, just like it was the resultant force. And exactly as here, it works exactly the same. You know, it's easy to find out that if you have these two hinges and the axis of the hinges intersect in one point, the end effector of the serial chain will also instantaneously rotate about this point. So you're going to have this space of rotations closed under addition. And so it is a vector space. And it's again this vector space here. It is this vector space here, arrows in three dimensions. And nothing surprising here. On the other hand, if you look at the second uh, bullet here, uh, which says uh, on planar, planar R, R end effector, Well, what does that mean? Well, you have two joints. Uh, so this one goes like that. And here is some end effect. So this is it's a planar chain in the sense that all these variable joints are parallel and so on. Uh, well, using the same definition, adding the two rotations, uh, we obtain the rotation of the end effect. Uh, but again, is, is it the rotation of the end effect? If you, if you have the two rotations like that, in other words, you know, this is the sense in which this rotates with some you know, intensity, some amplitude omega 1 and another amplitude omega 2, what do you think the end effector will do instantaneously? Is it going to rotate instantaneously? Yes? Yes, it will. Uh, it will, and, uh, and where will be the instantaneous axis of rotation of the end effector? Again, you have 10 seconds. Like of time. Well, it uh, turns out everything is exactly like here. This go point up, this will be somewhere in the middle, closer to the bigger one. Uh, how close? Well, just like here, you don't have to calculate moments. Uh, so it will be somewhere here. And the length will be the sum of these lengths, I mean, of these amplitudes. And, uh, you know, that will be rho equals rho 1. Omega will be omega 1 plus omega 2. And this distance will be determined by the fact that the moment of these things with respect to this point is analyzed by the fact that this point of the rigid body, this rigid body, so this rigid body has some point here, if you imagine, this point will have velocity 0. Right? And, the, and you know, so it's exactly like here. So if I ask the same question as before, and the question is, are these, suppose that you have, you can choose your hinges any way you like, and you have all these rotations for planar, vertical axis, do they give you a vector space? In other words, if you take any two of them, is the resultant another one of them? And just like here, the answer is no, because if one rotates like that, the other one rotates like that. 
how will the end effect move? How will the end effect move if these are with the same? How will the end effect move? It will translate. How is it going to translate? Well, if this rotates this way, this rotates this way, the points of the end effect, uh, uh, no, it's supposed to be the other way. So the points here will go here, this point here will go up. So, the <coughs> so therefore, yeah, it, it will go this way. Right? It will translate. So it will translate, uh, in this case, like that. So, now that the analogy is complete, um, again, the, the space that you get, uh, you can geometrically imagine it as this plane with this pencil of parallel lines with this one additional special element, the translation or the couple. Um, it's worth mentioning that uh, Nobody had problems about this situation for since you know, Babylonian times. This, uh, for some reason, is considered more difficult than the fact that when these uh, two, that uh, that the motion at the end effect, uh, when these two hinges uh, rotate, the fact that that motion is another rotation with the vertical axis along the same line, this fact is called the theorem of three centers, and that some names attached to it. Uh, I think they were attached to it somewhere in the 19th century. So, <coughs> for some reason, this is considered more complicated to see than this, but it's uh, important to understand it's exactly the same because again, <coughs> some kind of lines and some kind of uh, uh, special couple element. Okay, um, let's go on. Uh, so, the way to, so as you see, it's not enough to look at forces. What we have in statics are not individual forces. We have systems of forces that act on the body. And as you know from statics, uh, you can always replace a system of forces by one force and one couple. And you can do this at every point. Okay? And uh, you know that's because you have a rigid body, so internal forces uh, you know don't matter, and so on and so forth. Uh, so, uh, so you can do that. You can do it at every point, and at every point you're going to have the same force, but you're going to have different moments. And the same is true for instantaneous motions of the body. You can describe the instantaneous motion of any body essentially with a serial chain which contains one slider and one hinge. And, uh, and at every point uh, that uh, serial chain is, is different, the hinge being the same, but the slider has to change. And of course, uh, so these serial chains here and these uh, systems of uh, one forces and consisting of one force and one couple, each of them does not represent a different thing because some of them are not equivalent. And the criterion for equivalence, did I skip something? Okay. I think these titles are the other way around. Uh, and the criterion for equivalence is, is this thing here. Uh, is this thing here. And it's called the shifting law. And it just tells you if you move from one point to another, how the moment part changes. And it's the same with the velocity of the slider. It changes in the same way. And it is, you know, the, the, the rule is uh, something that you you know well uh, from statics when you move. It's, you also know it from kinematics, but uh, it's better to generalize it starting from the uh, from the static case. You know, from the static case, you know how it is. If you have uh, some moment and some force, if you want to go to another point, you have to put the same force 
but so, but uh, for the moment, you're going to have the moment, and you are going. The old moment will still be there, but now you have to add the moment of this force. Uh, with respect to this point. And that is the same as there, I just got couple of things the previous uh, around and change signs and yeah. But you, you know that this is just how to change the, the flow of the static system. What's important to understand is that it's the same for kinematics. And uh, <coughs> Uh, so, in other words, what changes here is is this thing here, is this thing here, which is the velocity of basically of the origin, which is the velocity in your slider, right? But <coughs> you can think of that as the velocity of the origin. Uh, why is that the velocity? Because remember, the, the, the railroad joint passes through the origin, so it has no effect on velocity there, so the only effect there is the velocity from the slider. So, uh, so this thing is a twist, and the other thing is a wrench, and so we're talking about a pair of, um, of three-dimensional vectors. So, so, you understand these titles are switched for some mysterious reason. This is a twist, and this is the right, this is correct, and this is wrong. So, a twist uh, is a pair of uh, an angular velocity and a linear velocity. The angular velocity is the angular velocity of the body. The linear velocity is basically the linear velocity at the origin, at the choice of chosen point. However, it is not just one such pair. It is an equivalent class of such pairs because if you move the point, you get another pair, but these two pairs are equivalent because they represent the same instantaneous motion of the body. Similarly, for wrench, you have a pair of force and the moment at the point. And again, these pairs are equivalent if they satisfy the shifting point. And, and these things happen to be vector spaces. And the, the vector spaces addition can be performed by adding the three dimensional vectors. And that uh, uh, satisfies two things. The first thing that it satisfies is that it doesn't depend on the origin, which is not proven here. You can check it out. Uh, and the second thing it satisfies, it satisfies the physical definition that I gave you before. So if you have two systems of forces, you combine them together, you're going to get a new system of forces, a new range, which is the sum of the other one, of the of the ones that you started with. As for the the motion, the physical definition is now you attach these two motions in series, like some joints, maybe joints with four, two sliders and two vertical joints, and that will be the motion of your interface. So in that respect, uh, everything is nice. And, and for each of those instantaneous motions, you know, we have many couples, uh, many pairs of, uh, of force moment or or omega v or fm, and <coughs> because it's you know the equivalence class of that, and there is there are some uh, pairs that are more equivalent than others, uh, they're nicer than others. So they're, uh, they're the ones uh, on this slide, and uh, uh, they there you you look to simplify kind of things. You look at the pair where the f and the m vector are parallel, okay? And same with the uh, with the uh, omega and v vector, but uh, it's not. Let's look at the range situation. And of course, there are two cases. The first case is when this f uh, vector is zero. Uh, that means that your system of forces is equivalent to a couple. And, uh, uh, and everything is nice and simple. There's nothing simpler than a couple in statics. Uh, uh, 
no force, just a couple. Note that the point doesn't matter anymore because the moment is the same everywhere. If, if not, then you can find uh, a whole line of points, this one here, such that if you move the origin there on the line, the force and the moment become parallel with the same uh, coefficient. That's very easy to, to, to show. I'm not going to show it because it's really no time. But uh, basically what you do is uh, you take uh, you take you take this thing basically, and you uh, and you take uh, once the dot product of f with it, and once the cross product of f with it, and uh, and you get uh, a result. Uh, <coughs> so it's easy to show that uh, there is a whole line of points where when you when you move there by the shifting law, the moment and the force become parallel. And moreover, the coefficient is the same for every point. And, and moreover, these are the equations that give you where uh, this, this gives you uh, any point. No, this gives you the point on the axis which is closest to the origin, this perpendicular uh, vector to the, to the line. And uh, this thing gives you this coefficient which is called the pitch. And uh, the, so these two equations tell you the following. If you are given in any, uh, for any origin, for any pole, if you're given the pair F and M, that's how you get uh, these two things, uh, the line and the pitch. How do you get the line? Well, here you get one point from the line. And the direction of the line is the same as the direction of F. Uh, <coughs> on the other hand, if you're given this line and this coefficient, you can find a pair uh, for, for any point using this equation, where F and, uh, uh, is the direction on the line, and H is uh, uh, the pitch which was given to you. And this R is any point on the line. It can be this one, it can be any other one. So the cross product doesn't care about the component along the line. These three equations basically are all the equations that we need to know in all screw theory. Complete set of equations. <laughs> Which tells you why it is a complicated theory. <laughs> uh, okay, What's, uh, what happened here is that for every system of forces, similarly for every instantaneous motion, you want to find a canonical geometric interpretation. The canonical interpretation involves uh, uh, either, uh, uh, in the case when uh, the uh, omega f component is not zero, in this case, the special case. Uh, so apart from the special case, it always involves a line which is called uh, the screw axis of the wrench or the twist, and uh, a number which is called the pitch, and also one other number which is the intensity of the wrench or the uh, amplitude uh, of, the, of the twist. And this is, basically, this is basically what screw theory, classic screw theory is interested in. Remember I told you that uh, for normal vectors, we used to represent them as some kind of arrow starting from the origin. And we know that we add two, we have to draw another arrow like that, and so on and so forth. And we have all these geometric intuitions about that stuff. Well, what about these vectors? These are six-dimensional vectors. Should we draw them like that and imagine that we're in six-dimensional space? Uh, well, if you have uh, nothing better to do, maybe. But uh, the truth of the matter is that they correspond to physical uh, things in three-dimensional space. And these physical things are instantaneous motions and uh, systems of forces, a wrench or a twist. And these things are represented uh, geometrically in three-dimensional space in this way, by a line and a pitch and some intensity or amplitude. And so that's why and that thing is called the screw. So the screw is a line with a pitch. And because it's a screw, because you can imagine a 
a screw and a bolt uh, performing instantaneous motion on the screw. So there is the, the, the line on which it translates and simultaneously it's the line on which it rotates, about which it rotates. Uh, and, uh, uh, and similarly, if you have forces, uh, you apply the wrench by simultaneously applying a couple and, and, and the force. The special case is when you have an infinite uh, pitch screw. Infinite pitch screw is what we call the situation here when the F component or the M or the omega component is zero. So thereby, if by agreement, we say that the pitch is infinite. Uh, and uh, in this case, there is no axis. Uh, I want to emphasize that translations do not have axis, contrary to what you might think. And just like couples don't have axes, translations don't. Nobody thinks that a couple has an axis usually. But many people think that translations have axes. Uh, so, so there is no axis in this case. It's just the direction in space. That's it. Uh, otherwise, there is this thing called the screw uh, with the, the finite pitch screw with a line and a pitch on it. Now, these screws are not vectors. Because uh, why the not vector is because we remove this amplitude parameter. So if you add two screws, you don't get anything. Uh, so screws are like something like uh, unit vectors. You know, they form a sphere, not uh, some fancy space, not a vector space. Uh, so <coughs> in fact, they form a, a, a projective space, as I have to uh, clarify later when I look at cones. Uh, so here are some exercises for you, which we're not going to do because of lack of time, but I, I understand you'll get this and you'll calculate this. All you have to do is use these formulas here. And uh, the idea is that uh, these ones here, these three. And the exercise is to see how a, if you have this pair of vectors, of three-dimensional Euclidean physical vectors like omega and v, how this represents some sort of a screw motion, some sort of a line in space with some sort of a pitch. So you don't imagine these things as two vectors. You imagine it as this, this screw thing in, in space on which the, the body rotates. And, and uh, vice versa. If you have this thing described geometrically to you, you need to be able to get its components for every origin. OK, uh, let's go fast uh, now. So, if you want to learn uh, screw theory, in my view, it's best to look at uh, it as a, as a sort of a linear algebra. And look at basic concepts in, in, in linear algebra and see how they relate to these particular two spaces which we discussed. And uh, because, I, again, there's not much time, each of these uh, you know, examples, uh, well, not this example, here, but like examples here require you know some some work. I should choose some of them to do something, but uh, not all. So uh, basically, you know what the linear combination is. Um, I mean, what I'm saying is that it's useful to try to you know draw yourself like that the system and see what it means to take the linear combination of of two uh, or, or, or three uh, twists and what you get and so on in these examples here. So for example, if, you, if we just take the last example here, uh, a planar RR chain, which we already have here. If you look at the linear combinations of these two rotations that I drew, and then you consider the span, which is all their linear combinations, what you're going to get are all the possible motions of the end effect. Uh, and that thing will be some sort of a vector space, and this vector space is represented by, uh, you know, graphically, I, with this little picture. You have a plane of parallel uh, lines and, and this infinite pitch screw. So these are zero pitch screws, uh, parallel and on parallel axes, uh, or planar and one infinite pitch screw with a direction perpendicular to that plane. 
And this is this tells you all the motions of this end effector. And this is in general how you know you this works. You know, end effector motions are described by the span of the motions of the you know twist that you can put on the serial uh, chain joints. And similarly, uh, if you have uh, a parallel chain imposing constraints or applying branches to a body, uh, they, the linear combination gives you all the constraints that they can together apply to the, to the body. So, so these things, these spans are of course subspaces, uh, some basic uh, facts about uh, subspaces. Uh, for example, an important one subspace that's important are planar motions. Um, and uh, so, you know, the planar motions, uh, or the planar motions, translations, parallel to a, to a plane or directions perpendicular to some given vector, and rotations with axis parallel to that vector. And it turns out that this description, these, these uh, twists, they form a vector space. Uh, uh, and uh, because when you add two of them, you get another one of them. But it's kind of with thinking why that is so. Right? Because basically, you, you get situations like that, systems like if you take any two planar uh, twists, uh, their linear span will be this little fence like object on the board. Uh, so, you know, so they form a subspace and so on. Uh, and there are some rules that intersections of subspaces are always subspaces. One thing that I always uh, tell people, and uh, not everybody understands why I say it, is that <coughs> the difference of subspaces you know, is not the subspace. Uh, for the simple reason that the zero is not uh, anymore in this object, so therefore it cannot be a linear space. Now, in particular, in our uh, uh, field of robotics, all the time, people are really in love uh, yeah, when they, in, in, with the following way of talking. They, when they try to explain to you what their mechanism does, they always try to tell you the motions that it cannot do. Uh, so we say this body, uh, you know, has these, uh, uh, you know, these contacts prevented to translate in, the, in this direction. You've, I'm sure you've heard this many times. Or well, because of that, it cannot rotate. Uh, I would strongly advise you never ever to talk like that. You never say what the body cannot do. It's totally meaningless. Well, not totally. Suppose that you have a planar chain, okay? And you say, well, it's planar motion, so vertical translation is not allowed. Because only, you can only, yeah, it's planar motion. So, because of the fact that uh, all joints uh, with which, let's say you have a series of joints, a uh, series of chains with three joints. You know, looking from the top, you see something like that. So you have these three joints, uh, and you say, okay, this body obviously cannot. This, the fact that these three are like that, prevents the body from translating in a vertical direction. That is true that if the body cannot translate in a vertical direction, that's completely uninteresting because. The body cannot translate in almost any direction. You just pick a direction at random, and you have a probability one that you can, the body cannot translate in that direction. The body can translate only in horizontal directions. Out of three-dimensional space of directions, only a two-dimensional space is allowed. Talking what the body cannot do is really ridiculous. It's like, suppose that I want to describe uh, a plane in three-dimensional space. And you ask me, where is this plane? I said, well, this plane does not pass through this point. Is this really helpful? I mean, uh, yes, it may not really. May, suppose it's true. But it really doesn't tell you anything. You can keep giving points through which the plane doesn't pass forever, and you're never going to describe the plane. Because the, the difference of spaces is not anything that you can describe uh, unless you describe the two spaces. So you describe what the body can do, not what it cannot do. Cannot is, is really no um, Anyway, so the span that we had on the previous slide is, of course, the smallest subspace in which some vectors can live. 
dependence and independence are probably the most important concept that you have to understand in, in algebra. That's why we're not going to talk about that at all. Uh, 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 so, uh, I mean, I assume that you more or less know what it is. Um, and uh, the, an interesting question is uh, what, how it applies to twists and wrenches. So when are two twists linearly dependent? So you know when two vectors are linearly uh, dependent, they're one on top of the other. Content. When are two twists linearly independent? What is the geometric description? The geometric description obviously is that the axis is the same, but also the pitch has to be the same. They may have the same axis, but if the pitch is different, you cannot get one from the other. Okay? You cannot, the bolt has this uh, thread, you cannot put one on the screw. Okay? And uh, they may be parallel, this doesn't mean that they're different. They have to be on the same axis and at the same pitch. Uh, this, is, this exercise here, uh, when are three forces linearly dependent? Now that's a, a much more interesting exercise, which I'm not going to do, but uh, basically the, the basic cases are uh, this case here and the other case on the other board. If you have three forces passing through a point in a plane, they're linearly dependent. You can express one of them with the other. And if they have them three in a plane and parallel, uh, they're linearly dependent as well. Okay? However, uh, if they, you have them in a plane like that, they are linearly independent. And if you have them parallel but not in the same plane, they are linearly independent. So, one question for which you can maybe wish to find the answer for by yourself is if you have, so if you have two forces parallel, uh, different and parallel, for the third one to be dependent with them, it has to be in the same plane. Same if you have two forces that intersect. What if the two forces are skewed? Where is the third force? which is linearly dependent on them uh, if the first two are skewed. Okay, that's a question. You can, you can try to solve that question and give me the answer when you see me in the next days. Uh, it's not very difficult to, to, to show, but it's an interesting fact. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, Obviously, one thing that people know about vector spaces is that they have dimension, that they have coordinates. Uh, one of the part of showing the slides like that is to direct people's attention away from coordinates. Coordinates are fine. There's nothing you can, you know, in any calculations you want to do, you have to use coordinates. But, uh, you know, you should not emphasize that. So, a basis uh, is a, an important concept, um, and you know you, there are different ways you can. Uh, probably the most important thing about this concept is that for every space there are many ways you can define a basis. Uh, people, for some reason, always think that the basis is something like x y uh, out of x y z and so on. Uh, so. This is not a combinatorial problem, you know, in infinitely many ways you can choose a basis. Uh, it is not uh, just you have to pick among the vectors in the x, y, and z direction. And it's even, obviously, uh, more complicated when you have screws. So these uh, examples here are kind of uh, simple. Uh, when you have rotations through one point, I'm sure that you can speak a basis, could be rotations x, y, and z. We have translations, again, we have translations in x, y, z. So that you can have them in any three linearly dependent directions and there will still be a basis. What about planar motions? Um, well, the canonical basis of planar motion are two horizontal translations, one rotation with a vertical axis. You can think of it being on the z-axis, if you like. 
but any other, for example, any three parallel rotations, if they're not in the same plane, are also basis, and so on. Um, the, the standard basis in, in, uh, in uh, the twist and the wrench spaces uh, is sometimes called the Plucker basis related to the Plucker line coordinates. And the basis consists of the three translations. So you have a reference frame. So for every reference frame, you have one Plucker basis. And you have the three rotations, let's say we talk about twists, three rotations along the axis with axis along the coordinate axis and three translations directed as the axis, same with, with wrenches. So here are the, the two bases. Uh, these are the standard bases in which you represent. And so here simply these are, in these bases, the first three coordinates will be the coordinates of omega, the second three will be coordinates of V. Um, okay. Uh, so subs there are certain operations with subspaces which are important in, uh, in using uh, screws, for, this, for, for example, for constraint uh, analysis and other things like that. And, uh, and uh, these are sum of vector spaces and, uh, and the direct sum. And the sum of vector spaces is to take all the vectors, any vector in one and any vector in the other, and you add them up. Okay? And whatever you get is, uh, is a new vector space, it turns out. And the dimension of that vector space is given by this very useful uh, uh, formula here. Uh, dimension equals the dimension of the two minus the dimension of the intersection. And the intersection is always a subspace. And, uh, you know, so you, 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 this tells you uh, it's actually quite useful when looking at screws. The general screw theory is mostly concerned with, with subspaces. It's not concerned so much with individual screws. And actually, when you think in kin kinematics and statics of mechanism, that's one thing. Now I have a bit like a short lecture, so I'm just making pronouncements like the Buddha, six ways to Nirvana, and this, uh, these are the ones without any evidence, and so on. <laughs> but uh, but uh, like one advice I can give you is that the first thing. Uh, was that you, you just always think about the, the, the whole space of motions of the end effect, the whole space of constraints. Don't think in terms of individuals. Don't think the body can translate in X, Y, and rotate in Z. You know, just think it can translate in three-dimensional space and uh, figure out as best as you can what the space is. Like all its elements, what are they? Just have a picture of the whole thing. Always remember it's a whole big space with infinitely many elements of several dimensions. Uh, so therefore, these uh, operations of sum are important. And maybe you will see some examples soon. Um, another uh, important, uh, extremely important concept from linear algebra which applies to screws is the, uh, the concept of the dual vector space. Um, that's important. Uh, what are the two vector space? A little bit abstract. It's not something that you get in when you study linear algebra for, let's say, uh, engineering purposes. And the two vectors are, are, are li the linear functions on, on the vector space. So there are some uh, things that take uh, a vector and turn it into a number. And uh, <coughs> it turns out that these things also form a vector space of the same dimension as the original space. But there is no natural way to identify the two. That is important to understand because in, uh, in Euclidean places like in R3, there is a way to naturally identify the two, and that's why you don't have to distinguish them, and that's why they don't tell you about it. But in these spaces, that doesn't work so well. Okay? They, these things have to be kept separate. Uh, and <coughs> The there, is a, there is a way to identify the two vector spaces of same dimension, so you can always find an isomorphism between one and the other. And, and, but there is no one that doesn't, it's canonical, that it's natural, that it doesn't depend on basis. If, however, you choose one basis in one of the spaces, there is automatically a unique corresponding basis in the other. And that's called the dual basis. And the dual basis, 
is the basis of basically of the coordinate functions of uh, of the first basis. So the first basis, you know, every vector has some co unique coordinate set of coordinates in that basis. The second, the dual basis takes that vector, every element of this basis takes a vector, hits it on the head, and produces its coordinate in that direction. So i vector gives you i coordinate. And in other words, uh, when evaluated on the basis, you get when the dual basis is evaluated on, on the original basis, you get uh, here the chronic delta, you get zero unless the two numbers are the same. And uh, uh, so physically, dual vectors are extremely important. So for example, if you look at particle physics, forces and velocities are, are dual. And the action, this action of the, remember F is the sort of a linear function of, on V. And the linear function produces something which, in this case, is just normal dot product. And physically, it is the power exerted by the force of this motion. Um, now, for wrenches, it is again the same thing physically. It's power. So you take some wrench, which has F and M. You take a, 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 a twist, which has omega and V at the same point, And when you multiply them like that, you get the power exerted by the wrench on the twist. Uh, and this uh, number does not depend on the point in which you evaluate it, as you expect, because the physical quantity it really doesn't care where we chose the origin this morning to be. Uh, and uh, it is uh, basically the only scalar product that's kind of useful uh, in that uh, part of uh, the only other uh, uh, dot product that makes any sense is when you multiply like two vectors f the forces maybe you want to find the angle between two forces but if you have two screws there is no dot product of the two screws there is no omega uh, and there is no norm uh, no magnitude no omega square plus omega two square plus V1 square, there's no such movie because omega and V are different physical quantities and their squares are measured in different units, you can add them up. And more importantly, that uh, calculation, which is not here, this kind of calculation, you know, take, uh, let's take one screw, you know, given with omega and V, some twist, if you ever consider something like that, Ever consider it. Not only the units don't match, but even if you put some constant which makes the units to be the same, uh, when you move the origin, this quantity will change completely. Yeah, because uh, very simple. Because, you know, it, it depends because shifting law applies. And when shifting law applies, V will change a lot. And so, for example, uh, I mean, uh, you know, this, this, if you apply the shifting law, omega stays the same. But V changes. So if you go to the Andromeda galaxy, the V is enormous. Uh, if you're here, V is zero. Okay? So, so this, this quantity completely changes, and it's not, it does not change proportionally in any way. So it's totally useless, and uh, whenever this thing appears, you must be seriously concerned about uh, whether you're doing things right. There are cases where uh, norms like that can be useful, actually. They're mostly useful to find out whether the thing is zero or not. It's the only thing that this thing measures, is whether the original screw is zero. If it's zero, it will be zero for every origin, right? because omega square will always be there. So, so that's the only thing, because all norms are equivalent in that way. But if you want to measure whether one twist is bigger than another, or what is the difference of two twists, that is not so useful. Uh, OK, um, I'm running out of time precipitously. Uh, so so uh, these are the dual bases for, for the so the Bruca basis of twists and wrenches 
are also dual, but of course the dual, the correspondent, so if you take, you have to put them in the right order. So uh, the, the dual basis element corresponding to rotation is a couple. The dual basis element corresponding to a translation is the force, and so on. And uh, so we use the dot product to, to of, of, of uh, a twist and a wrench to represent this kind of thing, okay? Not anything like this thing on the board, which you forget about it, it doesn't exist anymore. <coughs> um, okay. Um, so, um, when another important issue is, so these two spaces, the twists and the wrenches are in fact dual spaces, okay? So the wrenches are in fact linear functions or the twists which give you produce power. Um, <coughs> the, the concept of, of dot product is usually related to orthogonality. So again, the two vectors will be orthogonal when their product is zero. But again, uh, for us, these, both of these vectors are in different spaces. Okay, in different spaces. Uh, so, <coughs> You have a twist can be orthogonal to a wrench, and the word that's usually used in screw theory is reciprocal. Okay, so it, a, a wrench is a reciprocal on a twist when it does no work on it, when it exerts no power on the motion. Okay? And, um, and you can get spaces. So, um, one of the main, one of the simplest applications of this geometric screw theory is, is constraint analysis. And there uh, you look at the body constraint with different chains and try to figure out what kind of motion it can perform. What is the allowed motion space and so on. And that involves a lot of uh, 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 looking for screws, all the screws reciprocal to uh, these screws, all the branches reciprocal to these twists, and so on and so forth. This, uh, uh, to do that, it's useful to remember some simple cases, and these are the cases listed here, okay? Uh, here. So you need to know when a couple is reciprocal to a translation, for example. Can anybody tell me when a couple does no work on the translation, or what? Never. It is always reciprocal. So it's very simple. So when, uh, what about if you have uh, uh, a translation and you apply to it uh, uh, some system of forces, let's say a pure force? Uh, when is it? Is this not going to uh, work? When is the force not going to exert power on the translation? We have the slider. You apply a force on the slider, uh, and the force has, and you don't want the slider to move at all. Uh, you don't want it to feel anything. The force has to be perpendicular to the direction of the slider. And if you add a couple to that, nothing changes because the couple never works. So that's true for any range, just the effect that matters. So, and uh, when you switch uh, 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 to a couple and a twist, it's the same. So when they're perpendicular, uh, uh, when one is with infinite pitch, uh, and the other one with a finite, they have to be perpendicular. What happens if they both have zero pitch? You have the door here, door, hinges, you apply a force, pure force on the door, which force is not going to open the door? You hang on the door, it doesn't work. What else can you do? It push through the axis, doesn't work. And, okay, the two basic cases. How can you summarize that? It has to be in the plane of the axis. They have to be coplanar. If the force is coplanar with the axis, it doesn't work. Okay, these are the rules. If you want to do basic screw theory, these things in red, you memorize. And then somebody wakes you up at 3 a.m. and asks you this question, you have to produce it without thinking. <laughs> Now, what if uh, they have, uh, you have an arbitrary twist and arbitrary range, so finite pitch, uh, because we infinite pitch, we already solved the problem, and skew axis, or, or not. 
Well, that you have to calculate it, and uh, I encourage you to do so, and you find the formula, and it's a simple one, and you can look at the formula and find some cases for which we have absolutely no time today, uh, but it's useful to do. Fortunately, most uh, uh, designers, for some reason, use always revolute with nothing joints. They always put them in 90 degrees a lot, so these first rules, three rules that are in red, they'll carry you a long way, a long way when you're looking at mechanisms without writing even any equations. <coughs> but if you have to write equations, that's, that's not a you know, terminal disaster. Uh, <coughs> so, in particular, you know, if you take all the vectors perpendicular to uh, some space, you get another vector space. So one is a subspace of the original space, the other one is a subspace of the tool space. Any space are called uh, orthogonal annihilators, or sometimes orthogonal complements. And they're complementary in the sense that their dimension complements to, uh, to, to 6 in our case. Right? So if you take uh, a space of planar motions and you look at the uh, uh, ranges that do no work with them, you expect to be looking for a three-dimensional space because 6 minus 3 is 3. Okay? However, they're not complementary in the sense in which you expect this to happen in Euclidean space. We play a space, if you have a three-dimensional space, you take one vector, you take the orthogonal complement, that's a plane of vectors uh, perpendicular to this one, and they're complementary in the sense that their sum spans the whole space. The intersection is zero, right? That's a plane and a normal, uh, a vector and a normal plane. When with screws, when you represent screws in three-dimensional space in the manner in which we talk, like lines with pitch, it turns out that sometimes a screw is reciprocal to itself. Uh, a, a screw is because, uh, as we saw, like a, a force, uh, for example, and the rotation. You know, if you apply the force along the axis of the door, uh, the, you don't open the door. So <coughs> things are self-reciprocal, and some systems are self-reciprocal. So for example, a planet system is like that. The planar constraints have exactly the same screws as the planar twists. Uh, so they're not complementary in that sense, but the dimensions are complementary. Right? So to, to look at some examples, uh, uh, here are some examples. Uh, the planar motions I've already mentioned. And uh, the second example is this one. So suppose that you have rotation axes uh, in a plane, all of them. You can have any one of them. Uh, so I'm not saying that this is a vector space by itself, but this thing spans a vector space. So you look at the smallest vector space in which these things are, and you have to find what is its reciprocal space. So for that, to do that, first of all, you have to figure out what is the dimension of that space. What do you think the dimension of that space is? So you have all zero pitch screws, uh, zero pitch uh, twists in a, in a plane. What, uh, spa what, uh, what space do you think they span? It is not two-dimensional because it's two-dimensional just this circle. You take two forces passing through a point, right? You take their, all their linear combinations, you know, they're linearly independent. They're different, two forces. And when you take the linear combinations, you get all the other ones passing through this point. But you don't get anything else. So it's at least three. At least three, in fact. Uh, and you can do, to prove that it's three, you can find three bases with which you can generate all of those. Uh, the other question is the space uh, which they span. Uh, does it include, what, what are all the elements in the space? So apart from, rotations in a plane. Is there going to be anything else? So can, you, can you have a linear combination of two of those, which will give you something that is not one of them? This is the same, the same question there. See this little picture? This little picture is extremely important for screw theory. Take, if you take, you see these guys that are parallel, some linear combinations of them will give you a vertical translation, right? So vector space, which is spanned by that, will include also vertical translations. 
It turns out that's enough. You get that? How does it turn out that way? Well, we take three uh, ones, vertical translation and two of those, and you generate, and you show that you can generate any other one, and that means that it's three-dimensional, this is a basis, and so on. Now, what about the forces that will be work? Are you looking at the forces that will do no work on any of those? Okay. Well, it's the same lines, same plane, just exactly what you see, but now you have to imagine forces on them. And this thing will be not the translation, but the couple. And uh, here are the other exercises like that you can do. Um, so, for example, you take this one. Uh, it's a little bit fancy here, so you, you have uh, you know, two planes, in one they're parallel, in the other one, but they intersect in one point. What do you think the dimension of the space band here would be? Uh, each one of those that you see, well, one way to, to look at that is to remember this formula. Uh, which one was that? Uh, this one here. Uh, you know, this one, adding uh, the sum and the, of, of, of two, the, sub, the dimension of the sum is the sum of the dimensions minus the dimension of the intersection. Well, if you look at this picture, for example, here you have two spaces. One is uh, this one here. Uh, this is the parallel one. So the other one is uh, this one here. Each of those have two dimensions. So the sum, which is what you have when you get the span of them, we have 2 plus 2 equals 4 minus the dimension of the intersection. And the intersection is not the points that are in the intersection, it's the lines of the intersection. There is one line in the intersection. Uh, so you have two pencils of lines and they happen to have a common line. So it's minus 1, so it's 3. And uh, if you look at the, uh, at the reciprocal system, which is shown here in, in red, uh, you know, it's uh, here to have a basis of it. So um, basically, uh, for example, this one is reciprocal to these ones uh, in the, the parallel ones because it's, it's in the same plane with all of them. But it's also reciprocal to these ones because it intersects each of them. Uh, the intersection line obviously works. And then you take um, uh, an, uh, an infinite bridge screw which is perpendicular to this plane. Uh, it's perpendicular to this plane and it's therefore perpendicular to this intersection line and therefore it's perpendicular to each and every one of the lines. So that's the basis. It's three, independent, that's it. Uh, you, can, you can try to think where are all the zero pitch screws here? Yeah, these are the zero pitch screws in the original system, let's say these are the twists, where the zero pitch wrenches, where the pure forces which do not work on any of those twists. Homework. Another example, here the same two things, but this time you see the intersection is not on the line. So this time the span will have 2 plus 2 minus 0 uh, uh, dimensions because, yeah, the two planes intersect, but there is no line in um, uh, the, the two pencils of lines do not intersect. Uh, so this is uh, this is a basis. So the, the reciprocal system will have dimension two. The system has dimension four. The reciprocal will have dimension two, and that's simply the basis. You can think uh, where the other ones with zero pitch in there are they, and so on. Uh, so these bases uh, of screws are called screw systems, and uh, you know they're. They were first studied properly. Um, I mean, uh, the, all this classic geometric screw theory comes from Paul's book in 1900s, but the knowledge of screw system comes to us from Hunt, who was the first to study them. See what exactly, how exactly do these things like? Uh, what, what, how do, could they look like? Now, if you take uh, any space of, take two or three. Uh, uh, twists or, or, or branches, and look at the linear combinations, you have a two-dimensional and three-dimensional space. Well, we notice that, you see, this here is a two-dimensional space. 
And this here is two-dimensional space. It's it completely different in, three, in, in normal space. One is a pencil of lines, parallel pencil of lines. Here is a, a concurrent pencil of lines. Here you have an infinite screw, here you don't. And many, so the question is, what are all the possibilities? How do all these possible spaces look like? And that task was solved in the 70s. So I'll give you a little bit of a taste of that. There is a classification which counts certain things, like the number, so I'm not going to it. But you know, one important fact is how many uh, infinite, independent infinite bridge screws there are, and things like that. And there's only infinitely many of those systems. Well, what do you mean? Um, well, what do you mean? There is a, a criterion of equivalence, which is the system is the same two systems the same way, I can take one and put it on top of the other. So there's a rigid body motion that identifies that. And uh, it, 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 up to that equivalence, the question is, what are the different ones? And they're infinitely many, but they can be classified with a finite number of parameters. And here you have some examples. So here, this is the simplest case of a, uh, well, not the simplest, the most general case of when you take any two screws, typically, let's say, skew, and you take the linear combinations, you get uh, something like that, which is called the cylindroid. Uh, so what you see here is a line surface of the axis of the, of the screws. The pitch varies along uh, uh, that surface. So you have these lines going in circles, and the, the, they move up and down this axis, as you see here. Right? And they have different pitches. It turns out that the one the two of them intersect at 90 degrees, and uh, one of them has the smallest pitch of all, and the other one has the biggest pitch of all, and uh, traditionally the biggest is put on X, the smallest on Y, and so on. Very interesting. You, know, you can read in the books about that, an interesting ways to calculate this stuff. This is the most general uh, thing that you get when you combine three screws. So here, you have screws in every direction in space. They pass uh, through every point in space, several uh, through some points. Uh, it turns out that uh, screws of the same pitch uh, form uh, these root surfaces. They regularly regularly on, on these uh, uh, hyperboloids. One of those hyperboloids is degenerate and it's two planes. Um, here is uh, the same system, and here is an example from, from the Philippe's book, uh, which uh, 84, I think this one. So you see, here you have a, a, a body, which is, um, where is the body? This is the body here, you see. Uh, this body is connected with three revolute joints to the base, which uh, allows it to move on the span of these three R zero pitch screws. At the same time, the body has three contacts with the base, and uh, so it's constrained by these three forces on the end lines. Uh, and they, if, the, if the constraint and the freedoms are the same, these two uh, families of lines will be on the same hyperboloid, but the two different, the two, the, the two regular on this hyperboloid. Other systems, here's another one which is spanned by some uh, basically, this is the more general system when you get screws parallel to a plane. So if they have a, these are, take two screws of uh, the same pitch in a, intersecting in a point, and take uh, an infinite pitch screw at an angle to them. Uh, that's what happens with the screws with every direction that is possible. So you have every direction in the plane, they will be parallel to this plane. The pitch will vary and so on and so forth. Uh, this is the robot that has the screw system. Uh, uh, this is another one where uh, you have again two screws of some pitch and one infinite pitch screw <coughs> parallel to, let's say, one of them. You get other system, another, this is again screws with every direction in a plane like that. Uh, I mean, I don't have time to. to there are lots of things that you can do with all of them and find out where these things are. Most of these things are not derived in a very complicated way, but we have no time. Let me look at what I wanted to talk mostly about. 
uh, for which I have uh, so ten minutes. Uh, so, uh, what we talked about so far were linear combinations in which the linear coefficients were arbitrary numbers, positive, negative, and zero. Uh, what uh, and that uh, remember the, the scalar multiplication, let's say of a of a force, is increases the intensity. When you have something like a cable, you can increase the intensity, decrease it, but you cannot reverse the sign. Same if you have a contact force. Right? You cannot reverse the sign, so you're limited with. Uh, so what you get, what you can get, uh, conceivably, are only uh, non-negative linear combinations. These are sometimes called conico conico uh, combinations, and the spans, uh, set of all such combinations of some vectors, the conic hull conical how or their cone, the complex cone which they span, uh, is uh, what you get, for example, when you apply, uh, you have um, a body uh, suspended with three cables. That's what the, all the resultants that you can have of these three cables will be all the resultant wrenches, because you cannot reverse tension on the, on the cable, you cannot get negative tension. And, uh, these things are defined typically by 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 these by this vector, like the, these are called the generators of the cones. But there is a dual definition in the dual space. Um, so in the dual space, you take um, and the dual definition is with inequalities. So <coughs> I mean, uh, to see what I mean, I should take the simplest example in two dimensions is V1 and V2. <coughs> and this is their cone. Because these are the vectors which you get when you take non-negative linear combinations. Right? And you can define this as the cone of V1 and V2, but you can also define it by these two inequalities. It has to be this way and it has to be this way. And if you call this uh, you know, U1 and U2, and the v, uh, u1 dot v has to be uh, right. This one is perpendicular to this one. Uh, has to be non-negative, and, uh, and the other one has to be non-negative. So these lines here uh, define two inequalities. Basically, dual vectors in, in the projective space, the dual vectors are used, often identified with hyperplanes through the origin. Think about it in Rn. Uh, in Rn, dual vectors and vectors are often identified. But you can think of, of, about the vector as a vector or as the normal vector of a, of a hyperplane. And so, you know, these dual vectors define hyperplanes which bound this convex cone. Uh, so if uh, these things form a basis, that's what you have here. You know? If they form uh, uh, less than a basis, uh, so they're independent, but if they can be complemented to a basis, there are similar inequalities that you can write, but to do that you have to complement uh, them to a basis, <coughs> then you have to find the dual basis, and then you can write this with the dual basis equations. So, um, and when you do that, you have certain choices here, right? uh, Because when you complement this to a basis, these, uh, these k min n minus k vectors that you choose, there are many ways to choose them, choose that these equations may, and when you choose those differently, the u1 vector will be different. The u1 vector is a vector orthogonal to v2 to vn. The u1 vector does not depend on v1, it depends on the others, remember? So how you complement will change this, which means it will change these equations. So for example, the same picture, if you imagine that it's put in three-dimensional space, then these u1 and u2 vectors do not have to be uh, you know, perpendicular to the board, right? They can be at an angle to the board. Because the cone head here is two-dimensional in a three-dimensional space, you have freedom how to define the inequality. Uh, nevertheless, uh, you know, it's yeah, be sure it doesn't cause much problem. If they're linearly dependent, uh, you just uh, you have a union of independent cones. Um, and uh, 
I mean, suppose that I get three lines in two space. Uh, if you take all the pairs uh, and take the union, you get the result. I mean, usually you don't need to take all pairs. I mean, in two dimensions, you usually uh, yeah, it's enough to take two. But sometimes, if you span the whole space, you need to take three and so on. Um, but um, there is one more way to look at uh, these cones, uh, because uh, cones, uh, when we can in increase, uh, they have to be non-negative. Uh, it's a non uh, the conic hull, if it puts a point, it puts all points obtained by multiplying the point with any positive number. So, uh, you know, so this is, these are elements, so to speak, of projective space, because they're just lines, or rather rays through the origin. Well, uh, so the actual dimension is one lower than the, the, the number of, of independent generators. And so, and that, you know, you can think of that in, in three dimensions, for example. So if you have three uh, vectors, and look at their cone. Well, this is a simple example. We have three cone. It's, uh, you can intersect that with some plane. And then this will be defined by the triangle. So uh, if you, uh, which, uh, by the intersection point. Now, um, first of all, this generalizes for n, in which case, uh, so suppose that this is a basis, v1, v2, up to vn. You intersect it with a hyperplane, and you get the simplex, um, n simplex in this plane. Uh, and if you have these vectors, you can choose the plane so that the simplex will be nice uh, like this one. However, so first you're given the plane and then, <laughs> and then you get the cone. The cone doesn't have to face the plane, so to speak. And what you get is something like that. It means that some of the generators intersect the plane, or the hyperplane in the good direction, but some intersect it in the bad direction. And if you look at then the intersection of the cone with the plane, you have uh, this again a sort of a simplex, but it's a generalized simplex. Again, with this, uh, in this case, this external triangle. Well, uh, how does this work? Why is it exactly these two? If you sit in the plane, if you sit in the plane, uh, What you see if you want to understand basically how things these things work, it's sometimes useful to switch uh, the description with the dual stuff. Sometimes you know you can go between one and the other to figure things out. If you if you sit in the plane and you have this uh, three points, and these points have some directions, right? And uh, if they are all in the same direction, well, it's in the middle. If some are like that, it will be different. And basically, uh, you know, you. So, you have to continue these lines. And what, what is the rule? Well, if you transform this into an inequalities, you're going to have uh, an intersection of, of half planes, right? And uh, if you have this intersection, uh, it's already, if, if I have this intersection, uh, let's say like that, right? Then I have inside. If I switch this here, right? Then I have this part here and this part here. Uh, it's kind of. I mean, it is actually only this point here satisfies these equations. But here you have the, 
the negative vector v satisfying the, the opposite equations. Right? But here, these points don't satisfy these equations, but they satisfy the opposite equations. And these points are, are different. With these points, all these points, they come the right way, and these points, they come out the wrong way. Right? So that's what you see on this picture. Um, that some of these points rotate one way and some of these points rotate the other way. Because here, see the cone comes, the street cone intersects here, and here it intersects forward, and this part intersects backward. So this is, these are not really intersection points with a cone, but they, they represent lines, rays, which go in the opposite direction like that and never intersect this plane. And with this, to represent them with this plane, you go and intersect in the opposite direction. And you just uh, have to think of these points as oriented otherwise. So you have these oriented points, either this way and this is this way. This allows you to represent the cone as a, uh, in this plane. And uh, that uh, generalizes in general, not just in, in the three dimensions, but in general in projective space, what we have here is that we have lines through the origin and represent them in a plane, which is standard representation of projective space. Uh, this can be, there are other ways to represent projective space, this kind of schematic drawing in which you have lines through the origin and you can intersect these lines with the origin with a plane, but you can also intersect it with a sphere, and that sphere can be centered at the origin or around the origin, or can pass through the origin. And you have different pictures which map the lines through the origin, or the rays through the origin, onto some kind of surface like that. That's useful because it gives you a representation with one dimension less of, of, this, uh, uh, of these cones and other figures that you have. So now I'm going to quickly go through some examples of how if you take two or three uh, screws, let's say uh, wrenches, and you take linear combinations which are you know, non-negative, what you get. So for example, suppose that you have two forces that are parallel, uh, and, uh, or two wrenches even with different pitches. If you take their cone, you're going to get ones parallel to them, but between them and uh, the pitch will vary, it turns out, if, if these pitches are different or it will be the same if these pitches are the same. Uh, more interesting is suppose that you switch them over. Then you get all these other ones outside of this uh, interval between them. And you also get uh, an infinite pitch screw. It's like if these are with the same pitch, you get a couple, if right? they're equal and opposite. Uh, and the other ones are outside of this, so it's like uh, uh, he, this is the case when one of them has an infinite pitch. And this is the same picture seen from above. When you see it from above, you see kind of the simplex representation in one dimension less. So you see this is like an interval, it's like a one simplex. It can be in internal or it can be external, just like the triangle I showed you before. And here you have uh, one vertex at infinity, the other vertex at infinity. Uh, here you have, uh, uh, take two, uh, uh, let's say, wrenches with the same axis but with different pitch. Well, what you're going to get is you're going to get in the cone more wrenches with the same axis. And the pitch will vary from one to the other. And if they uh, are in the same direction, not the pitches, but the screws, they're in the same direction, then the pitch will vary between the two pitches. If they're with opposite directions, the pitch will be outside of those pitches, going to infinity, uh, which direction infinity is determined by the direction of the bigger pitch. It will go to infinity, then we'll come back from here to this. And here is what happens when one of them has infinite pitch. Note that again, this thing is represented graphically as a segment, external or internal. Uh, if you go to two dimensions, uh, in other words, systems of three screws represented, which are two-dimensional entities, 
So this is a simple case when you have, let's say, vertical forces. So it's things like, you know, stools with three legs. Where do they tip over, right? Uh, it's kind of equilibrium problems. So if you have the three uh, uh, forces, let's say, here. So we're looking from above. And if the three forces are all up, the possible uh, conic resultants are in the triangle that they define. If you switch one uh, upside down, like here, you get the external triangle. So you get resultants here pointing as these two guys, and resultants here pointing as this guy. And so, uh, and here are the cases where one or two of them are with uh, infinite pitch. So, um, you know, the, I have done this for two or three systems for all of them. So if any linear combination of two or three. Uh, and some of them, like, like this one, is, is something that you should know. I mean, kind of, you know, I think everybody knows that, kind of. Uh, but this kind of is, I didn't know about that until I looked at it. So here, suppose that you have forces in a plane. Uh, so you have, let's say, three forces in a plane. So you have a plant a cable robot or something like that. And what, what would be, so here are the three forces, yeah. so one, two, and three. So what would be their conic span? Their linear span is the whole plane of forces. This uh, example, first example, of reciprocal side shoulders. It's a whole plane of forces and there will be a couple perpendicular to the plane. That's the space. That's the linear space. But what is the cone if you cannot reverse the directions? Well, if you look at the two of them, you get this cone. If you get two of them, you get this cone. The cone of the three, you have to get one here and add it to this one here. So suppose that you get this one here. It intersects this line somewhere. And here you're going to get another little pie slice here. And when you uh, think about it, or if you want, if you write some equations, for which we have no time at the moment, you find out that what's in this cone are all lines like that. What are these lines? These lines are the lines that do not intersect the triangle. They do not intersect the triangle, number one. And number two, they go around the triangle in the same way as these generators. Simple proof for you uh, how how you get uh, the what, what are the resultants of three planet forces and um, and also you get the couple because why because these three rotate in the same direction so you can get the couple however suppose that I switch the direction of one of those also like here so again so this goes like that, this goes like that, but this is not cyclic anymore, it goes in the opposite direction. Well, it turns out that it's similar. Well, it's the same in what sense? Here, you had a triangle. And a triangle gives a forbidden zone. And the line, the resultant doesn't pass through that zone. Well, here you also have a triangle, but it's an external triangle. Okay? It's like the ones that I mentioned here. So, and then here's the external triangle. What's the definition of this external triangle? Well, uh, you can, one kind of, the, one rule is that you go along the lines in a continuous direction. Other ways you can look at these three points and look at the forces uh, which have the same moment with respect to these two and the different moment with respect to this one. Another way to look at it is that, and this triangle here is white, you see, because nothing intersects it. The resultants do not pass through this triangle. There are all the lines that pass through this passage here, you see? It's like a little, uh, I don't know, pass. Uh, they can pass through here in a way they can, but, uh, but in the right direction. And it's the same direction as these guys. These are the lines that always keep two these two points on one side and one point on the other side. Uh, and, and here, if you think, these are all lines which have the three points on the left. Right? So here it's two points on the left, uh, one on the right. Here is the case when one of the uh, generators has uh, infinite pitch. Uh, several cases. Um, 
Interestingly, it turns out that the same rule applies for, so these were systems of, let's say, planar forces. The same applies if these are not planar forces, but planar branches of the same pitch. What if they are not of the same pitch? Then you get some more complex system, like this one. Uh, so it's, a, it's a, any kind of a system in which the screws are parallel to a plane, a pretty general system. Well, it turns out that although they go up and down, you see, these are the screws of one direction, so you see they, they change. They move up and down, and the pitch here changes, so it's, uh, you know, fairly complicated. However, it turns out that when you project them on the, this XY plane, uh, which is a special plane for the system, uh, each of screw, this is, you know, they all parallel to this plane. They all project or on different lines. So every line in the plane corresponds exactly to one screw. And if you take three of them, three of the screws in the system, they're in green here. You see, one, two, three. So they, you project them down, if you like, and then once you project them down, you have this kind of stuff. You have this kind of stuff. You see, you have a triangle, and uh, what is allowed is which misses the triangle. Well, here it is. So the triangle here becomes this uh, purple prism, and all the screws in the system which miss this prism are allowed. So if you take the screws with that direction, these are the ones that are allowed to note that these have to go this way and these have to go this way because they have to go around like the green ones. Uh, so this, of course, here you, you cannot tell what is the pitch of these screws and so on, but you know, uh, if you have a system like that, you cannot play this game because here they, many screws project on the same line. So for example, all these green ones project on this red line so this triangle business doesn't work. Uh, but it turns out that you can do something uh, which uh, is more mysterious. Uh, it, you can, uh, again, project them on the line, but uh, give them some, uh, in some magic way. You can, I mean, it's, uh, you can represent them, give them x, y coordinates in that plane which somehow uh, uh, turned out to be exactly uh, the pitch of the screw and how high it is above the plane. Furthermore, it means if you take two of those, their linear combinations form a circle. This is a uh, so-called ball circle. So in, if you look at this, uh, so basically you're looking at this system here, you're looking kind of from above, and uh, you take, these are your, let's say these three are your three screws. Uh, and you take these points uh, uh, by virtue of the pitch, which is here, and how high it is there. When you do that, you get these three points, then you draw these three circles. And these three circles define a triangle with circles. And everything in the triangle is in the cone. So this thing represents another screw which has this pitch, this height, and has this direction. And the same you can do with the different cases. Um, so you can visualize some of these in that way. Uh, in actually in quite a quantitative way, because you can send it. the coordinate in this plane tells you the pitch and the position of the screw. You can even do this for a general three system. There you have to use a sphere to represent. The, here is a cone on the sphere the blue screws, so let's say blue are, in this case they cannot be forces, but, and then you can somehow put them on a sphere, and on the sphere again it's a triangle, and again the position on the sphere tells you what the, the, the latitude on the sphere tells you what pitch it is, longitude tells us where it is. Uh, you know, there are many, same stuff can be done for any two or three systems. Um, I, kind of out of time, but I want to uh, still talk about So this this kind of stuff obviously you know, has some usefulness. Uh, make, uh, most cable robots now involve one body uh, under uh, forces. Well, this tells you 
if you look at two or three of these cables, what you get when you vary. Let's say you vary the attachment points so or you vary the configuration. This can give you some intuitive idea of what is going on. Uh, in, in, in principle, if you write yourself different programs, I mean, these pictures, they're all generated in Maple. I didn't draw them. You, know, they, you just keep the screws and it calculates this kind of picture. So you can give yourself such maps, and if you know how to read them, they may help you when you're designing these things. Uh, of course, I'm not uh, overstating my case. With four and five, these things live in three and four and, and five dimensions. So what you can see is, is not so much. But at least, you know, uh, in two or three dimensions, uh, uh, it could help. So if I move this one, how will, will this uh, uh, you know, uh, side of the triangle uh, change? Uh, now, I'm going to look at another problem which involves uh, not one um, not one body, but uh, a serial chain of bodies. So in general mechanism, if you like. Now you attach cables to the bodies and you want to control the whole mechanism with it. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the question is how to do it and uh, how many cables you need. Well, I'm not going to get into this stuff, but it turns out that in general, uh, and that actually is important even for one body. In general, when you have, uh, uh, if you want to, to have some vectors, uh, which in their conic span will include the whole space, so the, the cone of the vectors is the whole space. Well, uh, for that it's necessary that you have at least n plus one vectors, right? And furthermore, uh, additional uh, conditions are needed. So for example, this thing is good. These things span two-dimensional space in conic combinations. Uh, if you take any three of those, they don't. They will span only half a space. Do you see what I mean? Because this one has to be the opposite cone of these two, otherwise it doesn't work. And if you do that, you can do it. So that's basically the condition. If you, if for one of them it's okay, it's okay for the others. So you have n plus one, and any n are linearly independent, and uh, the other one is in the opposite cone. In fact, you can split them not one to n, but in any way. And again, you're going to get two sets of linearly independent. These two cones will intersect in one line. It will be opposite uh, direction in both cones. Uh, so that is in general. Uh, if you so the question is, can you if you have a joint, uh, you have one body with a joint, can you secure? Let's say the joint has k degrees of freedom. Can you secure it with six minus k plus one forces? And next question is, if you have a serial chain with k degree of freedom, can you secure it with k plus one cables? And it turns out that uh, for the one body, the question is yes, always, you can. And uh, for the chain, most of the time. Uh, so for one body, you know, in the proof involves uh, some stuff about forces and uh, screw systems, but you know, it can be proven that it works. And basically, the, the way you practically do it is related to the stuff that I showed you before. So typically, you have something like a spherical joint. Uh, let's say you have a spherical joint that gives you three constraints, which are bilateral. You have to add four more constraints, right? And the way you add them uh, is that you have to add three somehow, and the fourth, which is the seventh, has to be in the opposite cone. Now, to figure what opposite cone means, even without even calculating, you can use some of the stuff that I showed you before. You can, because you can take these three that cables that you have, look at their cone, their cone will be one of the ones that are known, and you can figure out how the force will, give, will have a component in the opposite cone. So this thing that I showed you before helps when you want to secure one body with cables. Uh, however, what happens if you have a serial chain? So you have a whole chain, and uh, you want to 
you want to find uh, a number of uh, <laughs> uh, n plus one, uh, one more than the degree of freedom of cables which you attach to the bodies. And in this case, that I looked at uh, first, they attach directly to the bodies uh, from, they you pull from the ground. You could pull routing through the, the mechanisms, right? That's what's usually done in applications, but they have that's actually easier. Uh, so the, the question, like that problem here is hard. So you have this chain, every body is, you can imagine that the chain is composed of articulated balloons which you want to fix with ropes so that they don't fly, fly away. That's kind of the, the idea. And it turns out that most of the time, n plus 1 works. Um, but what's required is that the chain is non-degenerate. What does that mean? Well, the gender that here, for this purpose, is defined, it's quite uh, restrictive. Uh, the gender that means that you have one joint, and the following joint uh, doesn't add any new motions than the previous. You have like two regular joints, one on top of the other, which usually doesn't happen. And uh, if you do that, um, I'll take five minutes. Uh, so if you do that, uh, you can do it. And there's actually, not only I have proven that you can do it, I mean, proof is kind of complicated, because it considers arbitrary cases, arbitrary joints, and so on. But what's more interesting is there is like an algorithm how to do it. And you do it the following way. First you look at the, the last joint. And you fix the last joint as if all other joints are already fixed. Uh, then, once that is done, uh, you go to the previous joint and so on back. And this works if, when you fix every joint, you are careful to fix it in a way which transmits a force to the previous joint. Just to give you an illustration of that, here is a regular joint, here is some end effector, here are two cables which will secure this end effector, it will not allow any motion in this joint. Now, that's fine, but here is another pair which also secures the end effect. So, with these cables, you are also going to stop it from moving. The difference is that with these, apart from stopping it from moving, you can also apply a force through the joint. And a arbitrary magnitude because you can pull harder proportionally and it will still be in equilibrium, whatever you're keeping in equilibrium against. Well, this, you can pull harder, but nothing will be transmitted through the joint. And you have to, for this method to work, your cables have to transmit a force. Why? Because that force is transmitted to the previous link. When you transmit a force to the previous link, you have one in the bag. And that's why it is not 2n, but it's n plus 1. For the first joint, you need one extra, but for every other joint, you have this extra already, and you just need N to fix the joint. So that's how it works, and you go down to the base. And the only thing you have to take care of is that this force which is transmitted can actually work on the next joint. And that's, uh, what, have, that's what the non-degenerate condition means. So these are examples of that. So here is your first joint, the green forces uh, see, this number 4 means it's attached to the end effector. So this is attached to the end effector. They stop this joint from moving, assuming that nothing else moves. And they transmit this resultant. Then you use this resultant, side 3. And with a, another force, you stop this joint. And at the same time, you transmit that resultant. Now you use that resultant and the new force to fix this joint, etc., etc., until you fix everything. And uh, this works most of the time. Here's another example with, uh, uh, with two prismatic joints. Here, these two prismatic joints, they in opposite direction, they move this slider in opposite direction, so they can fix it. But you don't put them uh, along the, uh, in the same, you know, aligned with that direction. Why? Because you want to transmit this uh, side two force to, to this link here. And then use it with this 
to stop this slider from moving and transmit this reaction and use that reaction and this and this uh, new cable to stop this joint from moving. So I, maybe here I had cases where uh, yeah, you can sometimes uh, you can modify, uh, you can get different attachments that work. So for example, you can proclaim that you cannot an attach cables on, on, on body one. This is equivalent to thinking of joints one and two is one common joint. And then you do the same. You fix this one, you get the resultant, and then you use three forces, so two new ones with this one, to fix these two joints together. Okay? And again, here, why these works, that uh, you can see that these works if you look at the pictures with the triangles and forces in the plane. Uh, uh, so here, here is a case that doesn't work. Right? Three joints, but here four is not enough. Why is four not enough? Uh, we were forbidden to put uh, cables on, on this link here. So we have to, uh, at our first step, we have to fix together these two joints. We do this with three forces, that's fine. But now we can transmit to this link only a force along this line because uh, it has to be reciprocal to both these hinges otherwise something will be moving so but that force also passes through that hinge so that force that you can transmit is totally useless for fixing joint one so fixing joints two and three together does not help you in fixing joint one so you have to start from the beginning and then you have five and not four uh, forces yeah, sometimes uh, you have chains that uh, don't work, but with the reduction they, they, they work. So this one, if you try to fix them joint by joint, it doesn't work because you have to wear the joints one on top of the other. And when you fix one, the red one is not useless for fixing the, uh, the joint two, the, the other regular joint. However, it is useful for fixing joint one. So you can fix joint one and two together using it. So the different cases, in fact, I don't really have a totally exclusive, sufficient and, and uh, necessary condition, but they are so uh, you know, restrictive, the, the cases where it doesn't work, that it's really insignificant for most practical application. And so here is one necessary, sufficient condition for it not to work, okay? And uh, this one, uh, in this case, I think works. With yeah, this one works, but again you have to do some reduction so it works. Um, anyway, it's took enough of your time. Um, so the, what I wanted to say is that these uh, mathematical and geometric methods are useful for, for this kind of uh, applications and I think more work is to come along these lines. I, I know about the stuff. <laughs> there is more. There are more results. So, and especially the stuff with the serial chains, you know, should be generalized for other chains and so on. What's useful about this procedure? You can use it actually practically to design cable actuated chains.
the conditions for which it works are in equality, so it works for configuration in the neighborhood. And then in, in some of these uh, more practically applied, uh, more practical application of this method, it's actually quite easy to design it so that it works for change. But the reason here is yes, only in this configuration, only because these three are on. Because the, the condition for it not to work is that the previous joints do not add anything that the following joint produces. Uh, as a result, whatever comes out as a result of, from, from uh, fixing the end of the chain is useless for the beginning of the chain. You have to start from the beginning. It's like the, the two different systems. You have two bodies. You can attach one with cables, the other one doesn't care. So that's kind of so. Anything else? Thank you.